We are in Parshas, Parshat Noach, uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 9. And we are going to, I'm going to deal with a concept which I titled, Rising Above Judgment, Gog and Magog. And you're going to wonder, how in the world are these connected? And I'll show you in just a moment. Today we'll discover a connection between Noah's flood and the narrative of, uh, the Noah's flood narrative, and the end of day's judgment of the nations, and which is commonly sort of easily referred to as Gog and Magog, right? Humanity can rise above this judgment by building a vessel. There's a Kabbalistic idea that we build a, uh, a Kli, right? It's uh, you build this vessel, and this vessel contains light, and this light elevates us in the same way that Noah built an ark and helped to rise above the flood that, that bought, ultimately destroyed uh, humanity on the earth, we can do the same thing. The results of, of this is to realize uh, or ask some very important questions. Why was Noah responsible for building the ark? Of course we can say it's because he was the only qualified righteous man alive at the time. But I ask this, why didn't God just make some way of salvation a rescue for people without having to have Noah build the ark? What do you think the answer is in that? He wanted the participation. He wanted the participation, meaning that our, our redemption and ultimate rescue in the time of trouble, we have to be responsible for making the vessel that brings that. Hashem is not going to make you not going to make you or rescue you without you participating and having some level of desire for it. That's what separates those who are righteous from the wicked. At the end of this class, uh, I'm going to address in the closing part how to form the vessel. What does it mean to do tshuva and how to form the vessel? I would like to tie this Parshas, Noach, to Zechariah, the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter. Very important chapters. First of all, we look at what happened during the time of Noach. Why did God judge the earth? It says that in the generation of Noach, Noach was a righteous man and he was blameless in his generation. Noach walked in fear of the Lord. Noach begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth became corrupt before the Lord, and the earth was filled with robbery. And the Lord saw how corrupt the earth was, for all human flesh had corrupt its ways on the earth. Everybody notice the phrase, very important, all human flesh. But it wasn't just the humans that had become corrupt, even the animals, we find out from this reading, interbred within themselves and changing of the animals and, and the different types of varieties of animals uh, bred together and caused freakish animals. And so it had become corrupt even down to the lowest level of creation or nature itself. This generation is set apart from the generation of Noah for this reason here. There are righteous in the nations now the time of Noah, there were no righteous in the nations. There were no goodness. And this whole idea of robbery, what does it mean? Did it mean they walked around with a mask and a gun and said, this is a hold up? No. It meant that their whole mentality was to constantly uh, take what was not theirs, to constantly rob another individual, either by their uh, rob a person of their emotional security, of their or financial security, whatever it may be. It was a completely, um, a world filled with um, greed at the highest level. Thank God we don't live in that generation. Manipulation. Manipulation, exactly. Robbery means it was just a corrupt society. And we were saying all human flesh. And the only one that was not that way was who? Noah. A sad situation. But you and I in this room and as well those who will be listening to this class are familiar with the idea that in the, in the end of age, at the end of age, those who are from the nations that leave their idolatry are B'nai Noah, from the house of Noah, correct? Meaning that these individuals will help to elevate 
redemption and to help bring redemption into the world. It is once again the family of Noah who will take on the Sheva Mitzvot and more will take on the 613, even come to the level of becoming Ger Tzedek, a righteous or a good, a good uh, Ger. That person will elevate the world around him. And when he begins to elevate that world around him, then encouraging those people uh, in Judaism to, uh, to better observance and tshuva, uh, we will at that point begin to see a um, miraculous event take place, which is going to be known as the final redemption in the Messianic era. There is a religious view that exists in Christianity that constantly teaches this idea that the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket, and then there is going to be the super uh, Messiah that will show up and rescue everybody and take everybody out of this world, correct? And if we look at the patterns that are found in the, in the Tanakh from the prophets and from the stories of, of redemption, you see that that pattern does not fit. What pattern am I talking about? The pattern in the Tanakh is God says, you want to be rescued, you need to be responsible for yourself. If you want redemption, then you have to form the vessel for redemption. If Noah would have heard the voice of Hashem and said, ah, I'm too tired, it's hot outside, I don't want to schlep that much gopher wood, it's a lot of work. Could you just send some melachim, some angels, to help me build the ark? No, Noah didn't do that. It took him 120 years. Now, whether it's going to take us 120 years to finally elevate our, our neshamas and build a vessel of, of light so that we can see redemption, I don't know. But my friend, we're living in an age in which all of the signs point to Gog and Magog possibly happening right before our very eyes on television every day. Israel is in a pitched battle between... <laughs> safety and security and, and observance. Israelis are walking around with weapons that normally didn't walk around with weapons. They're looking over their shoulder. But what's, what interesting thing that is taking place in Israel today is this great uh, tidal wave of, of tshuva and unity. And the only way that we can be able to build the vessel that is required to bring redemption is to bring unity in the household of Israel, within Judaism, and in the B'nai Noach, the, the descendants of Noach who have taken on righteousness and to live a righteous life. With that being said, I have to look at the Tanakh where the prophets speak of the time of uh, the end of days. In Zechariah, which is a very, if you have, if you're in, uh, have uh, Tanakh with you and you want to turn to Zechariah, the 12th chapter, I want to read some text that are help to answer some very important questions. Uh, there is a lot, there is, there, are, there is more disinformation in the world of prophecy than information. And the disinformation comes from unlearned teachers who read a translation of the Hebrew text and they have no context to know how to interpret those verses based on the w wisdom of the sages, and so they just come up with their own, uh, what's the word, their own opinion of the idea. Today, what would be presented to you are the facts, and the facts of the text in context. It is interesting, in verse, by the time you get to verse 10 of Zechariah, the prophet is telling, foretelling of, um, of how... God himself will protect Israel. God will protect Israel. And as dangerous as everything has become, and as difficult as this has become, tshuva is the reason why Israel is going through the difficulties right now. It is to shake them up and to cause them to do tshuva. Many of those people, most all those people that have been killed by knife stabbings were religious people. Why do you, why do, what did the sages say about that? where there was a judgment of a thousand people that needed to, of unrighteous people, they need to do tshuva. It's better to take one righteous to cause the tshuva of a thousand. Does it make sense? This whole idea. In Zechariah, chapter 10, I find it interesting that there is a quote that says, and they, they will mourn, and they will all mourn 
uh, those who were stabbed. It's an interesting little text that just popped out on me, and it was interesting how close we are to redemption. Verse 12, it says, chapter 12 says, verse 1, the prophecy of Hashem concerning Israel. It says, the word of Hashem who stretched, stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the world, or earth, who fashions the spirit of man, Within him, behold, I am making Jerusalem a cup of poison for all people all around. Also, Judah will take part in the siege of Jerusalem. It shall be on that day that I will make Jerusalem for all the people a burdensome stone whose bearers will come uh, uh, lacerated. Interesting, interesting words. In which he says that I will make Jerusalem like a bitter cup. Now, what does it mean? It means precisely this. Not one nation knows how to deal with Israel. They've tried. They can't deal with them. Now, they've tried with a few surrounding Arab nations to deal with them in 67 and during the Yom Kippur War. Didn't succeed. The problem with Israel is that they, they are standing on a moral ground that absolutely has become a bitter cup for everyone. The whole idea of the Arabs in the West Bank and the Arabs who wanting to have their own state. All of these things are a constant sort of grind on the nations. And who knows what is going to happen? One great rabbi who's alive to this day, a great Torah Chacham export, expert, says that Gog and Magog, uh, God has averted Gog and Magog for Israel and put it in Syria. It may be true. We don't know. But once again, all the players for Gog and Magog has been in place for quite some time. And I'm going to explain to you in a moment, what is Gog and Magog? Really important to know. He says, in that day, I will make Jerusalem for all the people a burdensome stone whose bearers all become lacerated. The verse before that says, um, it says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of poison for peoples all around, and Judah will take part in the siege of Jerusalem. Does that strike you kind of odd? Why would Judah take part in the siege of Israel? It seems that somehow the nations are going to convince probably the secular uh, world of Israel to participate in the siege of Jerusalem. Who knows? I didn't write that. This is what this, the, the, the prophet Zechariah says. It says in the commentary here for verse 2, he said, Judah will take part in the siege of Jerusalem. These nations will force Judah to participate with them in the siege of Jerusalem, according to the Targum, uh, uh, Yonasan, Yonasan Rashi. At first, Judah, too, will drink from the cup of poison, according to Radak, and suffer retribution with the nations. According to the Mil Malbim, the prophet is foretelling that their way to Jerusalem, the armies of Gog and Magog, will lay siege around the cities of Ju Ju Judea. They will conquer them all and curse and cause their inhabitants great suffering. And verse 3, it says, And on that day it shall, take, uh, shall t make Jerusalem of all people a burdensome stone. The commentary says here, it says, It shall be, as says, Zechariah describes the punishment of those who will attack Jerusalem. The prophet had previously likened the, the city, the holy city, as a cup of poison, those besieging it. He now refers as a burdensome stone. Just as one who lifts heavy stones suffers scratches and gashes in the hand and body, so too those who attempt to bring retribution or attack Jerusalem shall experience the same pain and suffering. Uh, the, the next verse that I want to go to is, um, and if you read on through, it talks about how the nations will gather on that day in the word of Hashem. It says, I will strike every horse with confusion, its rider with madness. I will open my eyes to the house of Judah while, I'm, uh, uh, while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then their uh, captains of Judah will say in their hearts, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are a source of strength for me in their prayers to Hashem, Master of Legions, their God. And it says, On that day I will make the captains of Judah like a stove and a fire burning wood, like a fiery torch a sh uh, uh, burning sheaf. 
They will be consumed on the right and on the left of all the peoples around, and Jerusalem will again settle in its place in Jerusalem. It's interesting commentary from verse 6. says that the possible idea that Jerusalem is not positioned exactly where the old Jerusalem was before its sack, back in its uh, um, uh, second expulsion and exile. And that when the, the Hasmonean kings came in, they built Jerusalem on a site that's a little different. That's one commentary, one idea that's out there. That what ends up happening is Judah, Judah those who have been coerced to fight with the nation's armies to take Jerusalem, they'll realize this is crazy. We, Jerusalem is our strength. That's where we belong. And there seems to be a mindset set change right in the middle of this. Um, it says, on that day, Hashem will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, let me go back and read you exactly what the commentary says about the, the um, Jerusalem will again settle in its place. Uh, that's verse 6, correct? Verse 6, Zechariah continues his prophecy and foretelling, uh, foretells that the Judeans will then turn against their enemies the nations who had forced them to gather against Jerusalem, and like a great fire that will consume and destroy them. Alternatively, the Judean leaders who are outside of the city of Jerusalem would join forces with the people who are in Jerusalem to destroy the enemy. And Jerusalem will again settle in its place in Jerusalem. Now here's the thought. Although the nations had attempted to destroy Jerusalem so that it would never again be a city, it will nevertheless continue to exist and remain standing in its original place according to Radat. Now there's another commentary. It says, maintain that the, uh, the Arbanel, Arbanel, I'm sorry, uh, maintains that the city, that the current city of Jerusalem was, it was not built on the site of the original city. For after it was destroyed by Titus, it was rebuilt by Hare, uh, yeah, Hadrian on the different site. Therefore, the prophet writes that Jerusalem will eventually be rebuilt on its original site. Very interesting idea. Something that we didn't know if we don't read this in context and in the context of what the sages of blessed memory say. Um, we know that Hashem will, will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They don't have to worry about the problems. Um, it says, um, verse 8, On that day, Hashem will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. On that day, the weakest among them will be like David HaMelech. Even the weakest of the people living in Jerusalem will pick up weapons and fight like King David would have done. An amazing concept. It says that they will, they will fight with no sense of with restraint. They will fight to the, to the end. Um, let's go to verse 9. He says, It shall be in that day I will seek to destroy, uh, that I will seek to destroy the nations that come upon Jerusalem. Now, here's where we start getting the connection between Noah and the end of days Gog and Magog. The reason why judgment came upon the earth was to destroy the wicked in the earth, correct? Well, God has made a promise that he would never do that wholesale destruction again. One reason why is he brings Noah into the world, and we see that Noah infuses the knowledge of God to the, to the nations. And even though the primary number of people are all idolatrous, pagans, there has a righteous uh, strain of people coming from Noah to Shem to Avraham to, uh, to Yaakov, and we see it just going on down the line to this day. With that means that many thousands of righteous people, the Zadikim, uh, Judaism and Jews, uh, Judaism and uh, Jews and Judaism, and the righteous among the nation exist right now. And with that being said, what God is going to do is draw the nations in. Now it's interesting. There is. It's almost if you, if you a good way to um, to see this. It's like getting prepared to bake uh, some type of baked good, and you take the flour and you put it through a sifting process. Right? You want to get the lumps out. And so what Hashem is getting ready to do when He draws the nations in is mixed amongst the armies of these nations are righteous people, right? Are good righteous people, and He is going to create a very interesting environment. Zechariah deals with it directly and says, 
This is what's going to happen. I, and I'll explain to you in a moment. I'm going to keep you on the edge. Teaser is what they call it. Um, it says, um, uh, let's go. He, he talks about um, uh, Jerusalem mourning. Uh, it's going to be a very difficult trying time. And it says, um, let's go to back chapter 1 of verse 13. It says, on that day there will be a spring opening up in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for cleansing and purification. Let me see if I missed something here real quick. Um, yes. Um, it says, I will, it will happen on that day, the word of Hashem, master of legions, that I will eliminate the names of the idols of the lands, and they will not be mentioned again. I will remove the false prophets. Now let's stop here for a second because I want to explain something. This, is, this was the most profound part of this, of this text that absolutely stunned me. Because we've often heard people quote a verse that will come here in a moment. And it says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will flee, right? Scatter. And we've heard that attributed to many things. But when it's in context, it's a real shocker what ends up happening. Coming up to the end of days and the redemption that is getting ready to come is a sifting of the righteous from the wicked. It is a separation between two types of people. Gog and Magog is the secret word for this and for us to understand it. Before I go to that, I want to take you to a text. I want to show you a verse. Go to um, verse 16 of chapter 14. I want to read something for you in commentary. 16, 14 of Zechariah. It says, Rav Hirsch relates the name Gog to the word roof. Now we've heard this, I've mentioned this before, but I've not read the direct commentary, which is in contrast to Sukkot or Sukkah. With this weak, unstable coverage of foliage, this contrast actually encapsulates the religious history of mankind. The nations believe that just as they have the ability to fix boundaries and build strong walls to protect them from earthly rivals, so do they imagine that they have the power to protect themselves from God above. They imagine that they can build a roof and take their fate into their own hands, rendering themselves independent of God. The war of Gog and Magog is then the battle of Gog against Magog, the fight of the roof, the illustration of human greatness that has never allowed man to rest, against the sukkah. The truth of cheerful confidence and serenity that the rest of uh, the result of placing one's trust in God's protection. That is, according to Rav Hirsch, further points out this, that this conflict was the root of the first sin in the battle or the, uh, the Tower of Babel. It's the very same thing that took place. We remember, and we'll, we'll read it in, the next, in this next portion, or the Tower of Babel, we have a guy by the name of Nimrod who pretty much sort of gets in the face of God. Very, very arrogant, very strong, powerful man, and wants to unite all the people against the creator of the universe. Basically saying, we have the power to build this, straw this strong tower, and we'll show God that we can connect, right? So, with that being said, let's go back to what is going to precede this event, okay? And what is Gog and Magog? Um, it says there's a spring that's going to open up, the spring for cleansing and purification. It says, I will eliminate the names of the idols of the land. How is God going to eliminate the names of the idol from the land? It says, they will not be mentioned again. How is it going to be that they will not be mentioned again? It's, it's that true, but the most profound thing is what we're going to read next, and it'll say that the miraculous... Events that would put the overpowering uh, darkness that comes upon the world, and then the miraculous rescue of Jerusalem and the Jewish people will be so profound that not a single soul will ever doubt that this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It, it will completely decimate who uh, uh, your idol worship. Let me let's go on. Let's see what this says. It says. Um, 
I will remove false prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. It will happen when a man will prophesy falsely in, in the future that his father and his mother who, who had borne him will say to him, you should not live for you have spoken falsehood in the name of God. His father and mother who bore him uh, will stab him when he prophesies. Now this, th listen for this second. I, it will happen on that day. The prophets will be ashamed, each one of his vision, when he prophesied, and they, they will no longer wear the fur cloak in order to declare their lies. Rather, he will say, I am not a prophet. I'm a worker of the land for a person, uh, uh, for a person took me as a herdsman since my youth. Now what does this say? This is speaking of the... Uh, Balaams, right? This is speaking of the Gentile false prophets who have been declaring, thus saith the word of the Lord. And then when prophecy unfolds, as Zechariah says it will be, they will be so embarrassed they will never even want to admit they ever said the things they said. The, the millions of dollars sold in books in the Christian world called Left Behind declare absolute false prophecy. But nobody knows that because they don't know what Zechariah, they don't know what the great prophets say. And I can go on and on. Just recently there was a series of books and videos that could be rented and purchased that foretold the destruction of the world on September 28th. Didn't happen, did it? When Mashiach does come, when Gog and Magog unfolds, those who are in the world of false prophecy will be so embarrassed that with this concept of their, their mother and father stabbing them in the neck, which will mean their family members will be like, just go, go away, disappear. Don't have anything to do with you anymore. Now, I, I expressed this the other day to someone, and I said I'm concerned about those people who are so caught up in, their, in false prophecies that when the real prophecy begins to unfold, according to Zechariah, they will become atheists. They will hate God because they believe their false prophets are connected to the creator of the universe. Now, there'll be others who will fall on their face and repent, and they will come to Hashem. And when we see what they do, this is such an exciting text. This is a very exciting text. Let's go on. It says... Um, you know, the end in verse 5 is basically saying, no, I'm not a prophet, I'm just a farmer. <laughs> I was brought out here a long time ago, right? The guy's, no, I think, I think I saw you on television. Didn't you have like sold 60 billion books? No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. All right? Um, he says, um, interesting idea. Verse 6 says, let me read this. And if someone will say to him, what are these scars between your arms? He will say, it is first from when I was beaten in the house of whom I loved. Now, I've heard Christianity quote this, and this is about the Mashiach, right? Their, their Messiah. What this is about is the false prophet who will attempt to flay himself and beat himself because of the knowledge that he now has of truth. It says the self-flagellation will cause the spirit of prophecy to rest upon them. See 1 Kings 18.28. In essence, the questioner is accused, accusing the false prophet of continuing his false prophecies as indicated by the cuts on his back. The false prophet then replies to his wounds, these are beatings that was received from the house of those who loved me. So, let's move on. Um, so, we understand that there is going to be uh, a major purging that's going to take place in the land of Israel during this time. And it's going to be like putting fire, uh, uh, silver through fire. It's going to purify it. And the idea is that uh, a large number, up to a third of people, will be destroyed uh, within the world and also uh, in Israel. And then we go into chapter 14. It says, And behold, a day is coming for Hashem when your spoils will be divided up, 
in your midst, and I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem for the war. The city will be captured, the house, houses will be pillaged, and the women will be violated. Half of the city will go out into exile, but the rest of the people will, will, uh, will be eliminated from the city. Hashem will go out and wage war with those nations, as I have waged war in the days of battle. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and which uh, faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle, to east to west, form in a wide valley. Half of the mountain will move north, half of the mountain will move south, and you will flee into the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach Azal, and you will flee as you flee from the earthquake. Let me cover some commentary on this. So what's going to happen is at the time that the nations gather around uh, Jerusalem, it seems that most of Israel is already under siege and captured. Uh, that probably all the way up to Jerusalem is completely occupied by the armies. Something fantastic takes place in which the Mount of Olives are split. And out of the Mount of Olives will flow a living water, which is fresh spring water will come out, and will flow into the uh, Dead Sea and flow into uh, the, the, uh, the Mediterranean. Or Dead Sea, I think, no, the Dead Sea and, um, and the Red Sea, or Red sea. Um, water will flow. The, the Dead Sea will come alive again. This living water is also a metaphor of the living waters that will flow out of Zion to begin to feed the nations and to take care of them. An amazing, amazing concept. He says he will gather the nations together, and in the nations gathered there will be both gogs and magogs those who who have a covering they think that they're all, all themselves they are self-sufficient themselves and they don't need god and then there are going to be those who are relying heavily upon god during that time as a matter of fact zachariah will say in just a moment that during this whole battle those who do chuva do repentance god will save them interesting idea as a matter of fact it says they will have a, a valley to run all the way into Jerusalem, that he will make a path for them, those who repent. Interesting idea, isn't it? Brought back to mind, you remember the um, cities of refuge? And it says the kings were responsible for building a, a, a flat, what do you call a straight path? Remember that? No valleys, no hills. They should lower the hills and raise the valleys. Why? So a person who needs to be rescued from during this time and need to be in a safe place, doesn't have a problem getting where they're going, they just can run straight to the city. It seems that Hashem will cause a place to where these soldiers, these people involved in this battle, will be able to run to Jerusalem. They will do tshuva and they will run to Jerusalem. But this is, this is a, has figurative ideas as well. Those people who are in the nations, who are not participating in the war, who see what's going on, and thus chuva themselves, God will make the path straight for them to come. And we are going to see something profound take place at this moment. He says that, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach Azal. Let me read this for a second, some commentary. <coughs> Zechariah foresees the fear and panic that will overtake the people, and they will hear the sound of the mountain splitting, and they will flee. Meaning the people in Jerusalem and around the area, when this happens, they're going to run. They're going to head out. And it says they will flee the mountains of regions surrounding Jerusalem into the valley that was created by the mountain, uh, Mount of Olives uh, split in half. And they will flee the place called Azal. The valley formed will extend past the mountain to that location. So in much the same way that the, uh, the person needing a city of refuge has to have a, a path made straight, so will the people have a path made straight to leave the city at this time. But they're going to come back. And it says, and you will flee as you flee from the earthquake. That was the days of, of Uzziah, king of Judah. If you remember the story of, of Uzziah, king of Judah, he went in and offered up an uh, incense offering that was uh, inappropriate for him to, to offer up. When it did, a great earthquake took place, and the people ran, ran away. I mean, it was a very terrifying event that took place. It says, the people will flee because of the earthquake as their ancestors fled, according to Radak. 
When an earthquake occurred during the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, on that day, he was, he was stricken with sarats, or leprosy. Uzziah had entered the temple illicitly and burned incense, a service reserved for the Kohanim, and was stricken with sarats for his flagrant misdeeds. If you want to do a research on it, Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 21. It says, uh, the sages of blessed memory says, explained, uh, explained that, that this caused the earthquake mentioned here uh, in Amos 1, 1 and Isaiah 6, 4. While the earth and the sanctuary shook to its foundation, Isaiah's pro prophetic eye saw God's glorious presence removing itself from the sanctuary. But what's different about this story in Zechariah is Hashem is not removing His presence. He's returning to Jerusalem. So the event of, the Mount, of, of, of Mount of Olives splitting in two is the creator of the universe bringing His Shekinah back to, back to uh, the earth. There is some indication that the great sacrifice that is taking place amongst the Jewish people, personal sacrifice of death amongst the Jewish people during this time, it causes uh, Hashem's divine presence to come back to Israel, come back to Jerusalem and rest. When it does, that divine light will bring destruction upon the people of the nations. Now, let's continue on. It says, it will be that day, it will be on that day, the light, the light will be neither very bright nor very dim. It will be a unique day. It will be known as Hashem's day or the day of the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will happen toward evening time, and there will be light. And it shall be on that day spring water will flow out of Jerusalem. What the sages of blessed memory are saying here is that this is not talking about visible light. This is talking about such a dark time that all the nations are going to be a bit confused. They're not sure whether they just witnessed a miracle and was this like the creator of the universe doing something amazing and a miraculous event is getting ready to change the whole world? Or is this so bad that we're all getting ready to die? You see the difference? I mean, it's so dim. It's like it's not bright. It's not light. It's not dark. It's just dim, meaning a very, very dismal time. At this time, something begins to shake in the hearts of people. It said... Um, that... Uh, let's go on. It says... This spring that flows out of Mount of Olives will flow half to the eastern uh, sea and half to the western sea. This will be in summer and winter, meaning that the water is not going to have any effect whether it's summer or winter. You understand it will flow. It will be amazing flow. This will be in summer and winter. Hashem will be king over the land on that day. Hashem will be one and His name will be one. It says the entire land will change to a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will become lofty, and it will be settled in its place from the gate of Benjamin. Um, what does it mean that the, the entire land will be changed to a plain? God will transform the entire world into a flat plain. What is, is he talking about there won't be any mountains anymore? What it seems to be saying is that all of the obstacles that the nations would have to clarity and understanding will be completely made level, right? Level playing field. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be so painfully obvious for the righteous to do tshuva and the righteous to know exactly what's happening. And at the same time, the unrighteous, those who, who are, are part of Gog, you understand, those people... Uh, it will be so profoundly uh, clear what is happening. An amazing thing. He says, this will be, uh, he says there will be a plague, verse, uh, chapter, uh, verse 12, that will strike the peoples that have organized themselves against Jerusalem. Each one's flesh will melt away while standing on his feet. Each one's eyes will melt away in their sockets. Each one's tongue will melt away in their mouths. And it shall be on that day that there will be a great panic of Hashem among them, each one will grab the hand of his fellow, and the hand will be raised up against the hand of his fellow. Sounds like the zombie apocalypse, doesn't it? Whether this plague is um, some unique plague, whether this is an atomic weapon, whether this is a chemical warfare thing, 
I don't know, and I'm not here to pronosticate that. It's not my business, but obvious that those people who come against Jerusalem uh, are going to get uh, have to deal with a very serious event. And it says that they will raise their hand then against each other. Now, there's a precedent of this happening in warfare with Israel. Often, Israel's armies would, uh, uh, enemies would become confounded and they would fight each other. Remember, there's been many stories throughout the Tanakh. What seems to happen is at the time that Judea, the, uh, the probably the secular state, is, uh, is coerced by the nations to, to capture Jerusalem from whomever has Jerusalem at the time, more than likely this, the righteous who would be there to defend it, the Judea, the Judeans, or Judah, will then realize, oh, this is insane. That's our city. We, we get our strength from the city. So it says they will become like fire to the right and the left. They will flank the enemy and fight fiercely against the enemy. The enemy at this time is going to be like, holy schmoly, what's happening here? And they're going to fight harder for Jerusalem. And part of the city will be destroyed, or not destroyed as much as captured and its people uh, pillaged and its property pillaged. At this time, this is when the Mount of Olives are split and the very divine presence of God rests upon Jerusalem. When it rests upon Jerusalem, absolute fear and trembling hits everyone because everyone's going to realize this was not a nuclear weapon. This was not a, 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 a phenomenon created by an army. This has to be the hand of God. The people, the nations who are watching this on the news are going to go, is this the end? Or is this the beginning of something really fantastic? When the plague hits these guys and they start fighting each other, then it says, says, Judah will wage war against Jerusalem. The wealth of the nations around will be gathered, gold, silver, garments in great abundance. And similarly will be plagues of horses, the mules and camel, the donkey, the animals will be uh, in those camps just like this plague. Um, and it says, and it shall be that who are left over in all the nations who have invaded Jerusalem will come up every year to worship King of Glory. Meaning that this event is going to be so profound in the world that they will mark Sukkot, which we know that this event is going to end on Sukkot, right? It's over with. It's the whole metaphor of, of being drawn out of the physical world and elevated to a higher level is just profound. And it says that on this day, this miracle is so profound, and the whole world will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one true God. There are no idols. All idols, it says, will bow down to the Creator, right? This idea, it would it'd be ridiculous for someone to worship another God when clearly they know who the one true God is from this event. After this takes place, they will mark Sukkot as the day that God came to earth. Amazing event, huh? And it says each year the people will come and celebrate it. But it says there will be some whose who's conversion, because there'll be people in the nations who will say, that's it. I'm, I want to be part of the Jewish people. It says that Hashem's going to test them during this time, during the Messianic era. And they will build Sukkot, Sukkot. They will get in the Sukkot, and it'll be hot, and it'll be mosquitoes, and it'll be uncomfortable, and it's not fun. And then they'll quit doing it. It says that they will kick down their Sukkot and decide, this is crazy, we're not going to do this. This is insane. Said God will then cause it to not rain in their land. Why is that? You see, God only promised that first to the children of Israel in the land of Israel. Correct? And he, he, he followed through with that. But how is that different now with the nations? Well, basically it's this. The creator of the universe is coming back to possess his creation and to take ownership once again, without question, everyone will know he's in charge of this place. Meaning, this country, North America, South America, Europe, European countries do not belong to the people. They belong to God. And if they refuse to celebrate the very day that God came and brought about redemption for his people, 
He'll cause it not to rain on their land. An incredible idea to see that. So, in closing, I'm sorry I've taken so long, but I've been wanting to cover this, and it's like, I've just been excited about covering this to you. I'll go through this fairly quickly because most of this is a no-brainer, but I do want to go through it. I said in the beginning, I asked this question, why did God ask or require Noah to build the ark? Well, because we understand that it wasn't just because he was a righteous man, but it was because of this very important fact, that freedom isn't free. And liberty has to cost. And that if you want to receive redemption in the end of age, you're going to have to build the vessel that will elevate your soul to the level that you are brought above that. This vessel is known in Kabbalistic ideas as a vessel that gathers light. The three key points to doing this, and I'll read through them. First, you form this vessel by awakening your desire. What do you desire? What is it you want? Do you want materialism? Do you want the physical world? Or do you want to connect to God at the highest level by whatever means possible? That's desire. If your desire is to get up and to eat and sate yourself and to have pleasure and to not study Torah, to not pray, to not engage in meditation, to not connect to the Creator, then your desires are not desires of, uh, to, that's going to carve out the vessel of light. It will be one that will have to float in the turmoil and tribulation of difficulties. Next, purify in your desire. That's what I was talking about. Everyone has desire, don't we? We all do. We have desires for good things that are not necessarily productive. Purifying them, according to the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Kamlazato says in the Path of the Just, that a person should even purify their good intentions. They should be careful to ask, this might be good, but is it productive to me connecting to the Creator of the universe? Does this give me a connection to God? Even the good things. Next, we must have certainty and urgency. What does it mean to have certainty and urgency? Focus. The, right, focus and know exactly what you're focusing on and urgency, or as the Ramchal says in the Path of the Just, zeal and watchfulness. Zeal and watchfulness. Now, in the book, The Path of the Just, the Ramchal says that if you have zeal but no watchfulness, you'll be a fool. You'll do something and make a decision that is not the most prudent decision. And it's like the person whose house is burning down and they panic and they grab their cell phone. They don't, they, don't think of it, they don't think of the children in the back room. They just grab their cell phone and run out of the house. That is a person who's zealous but doesn't have watchfulness. A person who's zealous for, for God and has a desire for God will be zealous about doing the things of God, but, but more importantly, will be watchful enough to know what they're doing and be careful and very calculative about what they're doing. We're moving into a new year. God's given us a new year after Yom Kippur. And I've encouraged you to attach yourself to study. Rabbi Greenbaum this morning did such an eloquent job talking about how we should uh, make a new commitment. There's no holidays or no uh, biblical modim in these next seven weeks. It's time for us to buckle down and start reading, start meditating, start praying, uh, uttering the 72 names of God in prayer, meditating on those things doing everything with certainty and urgency. Why? Because that is going to be the thing that will build the vessel so when these troubling times come, you will be far above the fray. You will know very clearly what's happening in the world. You won't be worried about what's going on. I know there are a lot of people worrying about what's going to happen in Israel, but the point is this, God has a plan. And we know that it says His ways are higher than His ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Now think about this. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So think of something right now about God. Guess what? None of those thoughts He thinks. <laughs> think about that. That's incredible. So whatever you could come up with, I could say the most, most descriptive English word to describe an attribute of God, and guess what? God doesn't even think that. 
<laughs> His thoughts are not our thoughts. So all we can do right now is to say, you know what, what's the most important thing is for me to connect to God in a way that I've never done before and change the world around us. I will close with this thought from Rabbi Manus Friedman. Friedman. He has a great lecture that I hope to post here soon. He talks about existence, existence and uh, purpose, right? And he says, everyone has an existence. Everything has an existence. A stone has an existence. But if that stone is not contributing to its environment around it, it's just existing. And he says, the reason why most people suffer with tremendous depression is because they are too busy existing and not contributing, not changing their environment. You see, a person that, is, that exists without contributing to their environment is a very self-centered world. It means that it's all about themselves. And this is why we see great artists, movie stars, great famous people who have everything in the world. Their existence is huge. Their presence is huge in the world. Everybody knows about them. They have a huge existence. But they can be the most miserable, unhappy people in the world. Why? It's not because they're bad people. It's because they are not fulfilling the purpose. The larger that a person, uh, a larger a person's existence is, footprint, does that make sense, in the world, the more responsibility that individual has to bring purpose in the world. Incredible. Rabbi Freeman says that a person who's suffering from depression, anxiety, because the world just is not allowing them to exist like they want to exist, needs to change the focus from existence, from existence to purpose. He says, if you want to get out of your depression, go do something for somebody who's in worse shape than you are. Elevate that other person. You want to make a vessel in the world and prepare for the coming Mashiach, Messiah, then quit thinking about all the bad things that could happen to you and think about of all the good things that you can do for someone else. That's how we change the world. That concludes this short.